Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us say the prayer for illumination together. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Mark 10, 35 to 45. The request of James and John. Verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Verse 38, You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Verse 41. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles Lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among, among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. As you all can see, we have our boys and girls brigade members with with us here this morning. So, my sermon today is entitled Serving Others, more so in follow-up to what Pastor Andrew has been sharing with us for the last, uh, last month or so. You know, one of the greatest concerns as a pastor or as a pastor is always to get people to serve. And when I look, what was the reason we can have a very good example in the scriptures? Yeah? Being human, James and John, they were also excited or probably the mindset a bit clouded about how to be the greatest. And they were actually expecting Jesus probably to be you know, the leader of uh, Israel. And they were also thinking that once Jesus becomes the whatever position, king or whatever, then that they might have a good position together with Jesus. You know, maybe in our local context, for example, if probably Pastor Andrew is running for elections, you know, so I'm his uh, assistant, so I can imagine if Pastor Andrew becomes the prime minister, yeah, maybe I get to be, if I'm good to him now, probably I will get to be the finance minister a lot of contracts, you know, very high position. Or maybe I get to be the deputy prime minister. Or at the least, I would be given a post by Pastor Andrew as 
minister in the prime minister's department without portfolio. Yeah? So there's nothing wrong. In fact, it's quite common for many of us to be thinking along that, that line. Whether we're in a corporate world, whether we are working in, in a secular or private uh, organization, or even a government service, there's actually nothing wrong in wanting to excel in our careers. But we need to be careful. Above all that, the greatest is still, in the eyes of God, is something else. It's not these positions. Yeah? So when we look at it, what is the world view of serving others? We may think that you know, uh, we want to do something great in our companies. We want to, to okay. We want to be something more uh, famous, more distinguishable. You know, like Bill Gates or the people that we see. You know, if I'm chairing a board meeting, probably I feel great. But looking at the context of the Bible. Like again, I said, it is not wrong to have all these positions. But these positions, this place where we, we serve in this area, are only temporary. And it is not the greatest. Mark 10, 43 to 44, the verse that we have uh, seen just now, Jesus reminds us once again, to be great, we must first be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all. Not only a slave to one person, but slave to everybody. But somehow, rather deep in our hearts, there's always this conflict of interest. There's this co conflict of uh, feeling. Yeah, I want to serve. But then, our human nature, there's always there's a bit of, you know, because of our past, because of whatever reasons that only sometimes we only know, sometimes we may not know, we have that kind of you know, baggage or whatever that we carry. Yeah, I want to serve, but probably there's reasons or there's motives or whatever. You know, there's always that conflict in us to be able to actually serve as God has wanted or as God has planned for us to serve. Why I'm actually bringing you all to, to look around in our church. Yeah, you look at our disciples' pledge. We have done it last year, the last two years. We need to be serving in at least one ministry within the church and also outside the church. So maybe today, we don't look so big yet. I'll be touching on both areas, but look at our church within. You know, there was about three or four weeks ago, our brother Kai Chu came to pick Kok Wing from Young Life meeting. So we were, oh, sorry, to send Kok Wing to Young Life meeting. So comparing myself, and Dr. Choi, three of us outside the youth center looking at the young people, and Kai Chu was just saying that, you know, until when uh, we still have to be counselors, MYF counselors or young life counselors. I'm already 54. Kai Chu is slightly older than me. You can ask him, I'm not at liberty to reveal his age. And comparing also, we are all in the 50s. Amy are all in the 50s. Then Kai Chu said, wow, like that, uh, Mati Lo. We have to serve until we are 70, 65, 75. Jalan with Tongkat also still got to go Young Life. Which I think is a reality. It may happen. Yeah? Last Easter, when I was helping the ladies in the kitchen, and I look around, this one I'm saying out of due respect, huh? I don't mean to be rude. Okay? I've asked Auntie Lilian, see if I mention her name, whether she's okay or not. People like Auntie Lilian is still helping in the kitchen. You can ask her her age. But many of us were taught I mean, the girls uh, were taught by Auntie Lilian. So you can guess how old Auntie Lilian is. Auntie Lucy is also in the 60s. You know, we are all in the roaring, in, not blooming 60s, no, we are all in the roaring 60s or 70s, still helping in the kitchen. I do not know what to say. I say I'm looking in the church context. Yeah? We look at the BB and GB. We have been ma making announcements for the last two months, November, December, and I think until January, that we need helpers, we need officers, we need instructors to help. And there was no response at all. 
except two weeks ago, I would just start Alex said, never mind, I would just hold the fort. I thank God for her. Of course, along the years, we have people like Hong Pio, Seng Chin, and our br brother Kevin, but because of work and other commitments, they are not able to help us. We thank God for their past services. Many of you have served. But the last two or three months, we cannot even get one man or one lady to serve with the exception of Eileen, to serve in the Girls and Boys Brigade. And I think the announcement we put there, if we cannot find anyone, we might have to cease, I use a nice word, to cease operations of the BB and the GB. And then everybody kalang kabut, ayo, Danny, BB is going to close. Everybody asking me, BB is going to close, GB is going to close. I don't know what to say, I just there money. After the announcement has been over, still no one came out. And one of the ministries that have actually ceased operations with due respect to MW, not because that there's no members, but because there's no one who is a, who are able to serve in the committee. So why do we get so alarmed? Why do we get so excited when ministries are no longer doing what they are doing over all the years? The simple reason is that we just lack people who are able and who want to serve. That's all. Simple as that. Can you get the point that I'm trying to say? Yeah? In the local context. No need to look far. Look at our MW, our BB, our GB. Friends, the first point that we need to remember is that God rates greatness according to how we serve others. You know, our sinful nature is always with us. We always like to be served. We like to be king and queens. We like to act like mems, big bosses. You know, when we go makan, or if people can say, Danny, Danny, pastor, pastor, come, come, i let you eat this one. Wow, I feel so great, so nice. But for me to serve others, no way. Why should I serve Eileen? Who is she? I'm the pastor. Why should I take a cup of water for her? But when she gives me a cup of water, wow, so nice, I feel so good. Yeah? You see? Wow, Dina is taking the food for me. Uh, Molly is giving the curry puff to me. Lucy is giving the nasi lemak to me. Wow, I'm so nice, I sit down, I feel I'm so happy. Aren't we like that? Not all, but many of us can be like that. And even until such old age, we are still like that. What is wrong with us? I really do not know. I really do not know. I'm asking myself also. When I look around, I actually have no answer to it. Friends, true greatness, according to the Bible, is not to be served. It's not to expect people to serve us. But we need to serve others. We need to remember that, you know, the second point, it is not a matter of not how many serve us, but how many we serve. A bit confusing. What I'm trying to say is, is simple. Instead of people serving us and we act like bosses or memes, it is better that we serve others. And I'm going to give you an illustration, an example, a real life example in our church. So we try to look at the point of the person who serves and the recipient of the person who is being served. For example, if uh, Nancy Teo has done these flowers, I've given her, let's say, uh, 30 ringgit to do the flowers in memory of my late father or whatever. Then I tell Nancy, huh? Ayo, your flower is so out of shape, ma. so ugly. Yeah? Uh, hey, Nancy, I give you $30, 30 ringgit. How come only you use pom-pom only? Why you never use roses? Why the color only white and yellow? Why don't have red uh, carnations? A simple illustration. She has served with her heart. I gave her $30 and I complained. To the person who serves, I want to encourage you that continue serving. To the pers person who is being served, I ask you all to consider serving instead of just grumbling or complaining. Yeah? Friends, it is not 
how many serve us, but how many we serve. So instead of me expecting Nancy to do the flowers for me, I think instead of just complaining that the flowers are not nice, I should take the initiative to do the floral arrangement so that I can be of service to the rest of you. That's a better idea, kan? That should be the way. Yeah? And to the person who serves, sometimes they get very discouraged. I want to tell you all that if you have been serving and you have been receiving a lot of feedbacks, negative feedbacks, don't worry. God knows your heart. God knows how much you have loved the church. Okay? Hebrews 6, 10 and John 12, 26 reminds us that you know, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Whoever serves me must follow me and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Yeah. Talking about service, sometimes I just can't imagine looking at our church context again. No, another example, this is just an example. Lah, okay? Let's say if I need to get a leaf from Sister Iris. She has graciously uh, consented to, to pick me to church. And then I give her certain terms and conditions that she must take this road, uh, she must do this, she must do that. Actually, I tompang her. I'm at, you know, she's so nice to give me a leave to church, but yet I am so demanding. You know, telling her what to do. She is doing me a great, great favor by bringing me to church, but yet I tell her, Iris, you go this way, you do this, you do this, you do that. Because why? I feel so good. I am a pastor. She is the servant. I am big boss. Many of us are like that, whether we realize it or not. Friends, we need to change. And talking about the person who serves, you know, we always remember that we need to serve from the heart. Serving from the heart will help us to really go along the way. When we serve from the heart, our heart is like CPU. Actually, when you look at our Christian faith, everything revolves around the, our heart, our minds. If our heart is good, if our heart is correct, many things can be achieved. And the best and greatest way is to serve from the heart. Ephesians 6, 7 reminds us, serve wholeheartedly as if you are serving the Lord. So when we serve from the heart, we are, we are easily able to take whatever comments or negative things that people might say or might comment on us. Service can start from simple things, you know. We serve others by showing love, yeah? And showing love can mean like taking a cup of water for those of us who are not physically so able, or it can also mean, you know, in the times of need, in the times of comfort. For example, when uh, we, I'm saying we're talking about serving each other in love. Even in simple things like your presence. For example, if uh, our family member pass, a church member's family member pass away, what we need to do? We need to attend the wake. Yeah, being there is actually serving with love. Just a simple thing. You don't have to carry chairs. I'm not asking you to carry chairs yet. Right? Just be present at the wake service. Being a pastor, a Western pastor, we have to attend all the wake services because of our nature of work. And I can say, I dare to say that at any one time, the average attendance of wake services by our church members it's just about 10, 20, at the most 40% of the total church members. To me, I think it's very, very sad because we cannot even serve in this small manner. Sometimes when a pastor brings out this sort of issue, yeah, we get excited. I remember in 2004, Pastor Ting, you know, said something about attending wake services 
And then in October 2004, somebody passed away. Then we have so many people, praise the Lord, coming for the wake service. After that, no more. Yeah, but when we look at other churches, not to compare, you know, I attended a um, wake service of our Uncle Chuck Fu's late mom. The church members not only come, not only came, but they helped with everything from the chairs, bringing out the drinks and food, clearing up, setting up. Everything was done so nicely. And I told myself, wow, how nice if Wesley Church can be like that. During Easter service, I mentioned that it will be good that if we can serve each other, you know, by just carrying our own chairs back into the ranger hall. And Pastor Andrew has also mentioned Maybe it'll be, good. it'll be good if we can wash our own cups after drinking so that work will be lighter for the caretaker or whoever is doing the washing. But will it last? I do not know it has yet to be seen. And better still, if we can wash our own plates after our refreshments because Melaka is going green and we're not supposed to use polystyrene plates anymore. So we have to use normal plates that needs to be washed. Friends, instead of just eating, drinking and going away, maybe we can serve each other by washing each other's plates. Not washing each other's legs, yeah? Washing each other's plates, cups and maybe forks and spoons. Better still, if we can help wash the toilet. Oops, I said the wrong thing. Better still, if we can wash the toilet. Behind there, you center, we have two. No sound, huh? that means no volunteers. Okay, never mind, we'll wait and see. Matthew 7, 16 reminds us, By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Friends, when you are serving from the heart, when we serve, naturally, people will know. It can be seen. When we act, when we become bosses, when we act like Taukes and Taukenios, people will also see. The Bible tells us very clearly, by what you do, by your actions, people can tell whether you are a boss or whether you are the servant. And friends, our young people, our children, look at us as an example. So if we are bosses ourselves in church or outside, when our children do not leave a single finger to help you at home, it is only we that is to be blamed. Because we act like bosses. We act like Taukinios, kings and queens, royalties. Yeah? So when the children look at us, they follow our footsteps. They become very lazy people. So it is we who are to be blamed. But don't worry. The good news is that you and I, all of us, we have been made to serve. We have been made in God's image, right? Jesus is the Son of God. We believe in the Trinity, yeah? So if we are made in God's image, that means Jesus himself came to serve. We, are also, we have also been made to serve. So there's no such thing as that I cannot serve I do not know how to serve. I'm not gifted in serving. So if we are made in the image of God, we should be like God. We should have the attributes of God. Like our children, they come from our genes. So when we look at our children, you know, they look just like us or their behavior is exactly like us. So for example, if I'm a very thrifty person, I'm a very kamsiap fellow, Likelihood is that my son or my daughter will also be kiamsiap like me. If I use bad words at home to scold my children, likelihood is that when my children grow into their teenage years or even in school, they will also be like me. But if I portray a servant's heart serving each other all the time, they will also pick up this character. They will also pick up these attributes. Friends, there is no reason why we cannot serve because you and I have been made to serve. Galatians 5.13 You, my brothers and sisters, 
we were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So when you serve others in any way, big or small, you are serving God and fulfilling one of your purpose. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So when you wash plate, when you wash the toilet, you are not serving Wesley Mlaka. You are actually serving God because it is God's sanctuary. You are serving within the community of the church. Of course, when serving, we need to make adjustments. You know, many of us sometimes, I won't say enjoy, you know, we need to appreciate our worship leaders, our pianists, and our backup singers. You know, because for them to be singing up here, to be worship leading, they need to make adjustments. Yeah? Saturday, they have to come for practice. You know, people like Sean have to, or Sherilyn have to come all the way from KL, sometimes rushing, very penat, I tell you, penat, yeah? Come for practice, one, two hours, morning, come here at 8.30. So sometimes, if they were to make slight mistake, go in the wrong key, or may not be so harmonious, never mind, forgive them, close one eye, because they need to make adjustments to serve. The least that we can do is to appreciate them, to thank them, not to condemn them by saying that you sing too fast songs, la, too slow songs, la, uh, this, la, that. La. We need to appreciate those who serve. Yeah? Friends, we are made to serve, even in areas, small areas, like being a backup singer. Yes. Friends, we are made for service, not for self-centeredness. I mentioned early on, you know, true greatness in the eyes of God is to serve. But because of our human nature, we want to be served. We are so self-centered. You know, God told Jeremiah, it's also true, you know, before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. I'm reading from the NCV version. Before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. Friends, we were made for service, to serve other people, not to serve ourselves. You see, like Prophet Jeremiah, he had a task to do, to speak God's word, to remind the people and the leaders of the, uh, <clears throat> during those days. Yet, he faced a lot of challenges, but he did not give up. He continued to do what was necessary. It is because of his nature of being very clear of what God wanted him to do, and because he was not self-centered, even though he faced a lot of problems, he continued serving, he continued preaching the word of God, he continued to tell the people what God wanted them to do. But many of us, we treat God like an ATM machine. We just go to the ATM machine, press tick, 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 and tell the ATM machine, I want to withdraw $100, I want a statement, I want to withdraw $150, $1,000 or $2,000. We treat God like an ATM machine. We never realize that we have been made for service. We have been made to serve each other, but not to be self Centered. And let's be honest once again. Many of us are actually not bothered if the things that do not affect us directly, we do not care. Yeah? When we look at us, around us politically, you know, uh, I mean, whatever decisions that the government makes or the minister makes or the local council makes, we don't care. As long as I still can cari makan, as long as I can do my work. Uh, Normally, then I'm not bothered. These are all signs that we are self-centered. We don't bother. It doesn't affect us. I don't care. Why? Because I only care about myself, ourselves. 
I've got money, I've got this, I've got that, then cukup lah. The rest let other people do. But we also reminded that as believers, we need to be grateful people. The salvation that God has given to us. We always say, that, yeah, we sing. We thank God for all that have done for us by dying on the cross. As we look at the cross, we're reminded of God's sacrificial love. Every first week of the month, we come for Holy Communion. We are reminded of God's sacrifices. We are grateful. But yet, when it comes to service, it comes to zero. And yet, we are supposed to bear or carry the image of God. 1 Samuel 12, 24. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things He has done for you. Yes, friends. God has done so many things for you. Again, I want to quantify my statement. There are many of you in our congregation who are very grateful people. In your own ways, you are serving in ways quietly. I acknowledge. But there is still a lot of us who may be at the sidelines. And it is you people that I want to encourage to come forward and serve. The next point I want to share with you is that God can use us in areas where we are not gifted. Ephesians 2.10 For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. You know, many of us, we always say, I'm not gifted in this area. I cannot do this. I cannot do that. Because why? I'm not gifted. But if you look around examples, even rich men, millionaires, sometimes they get into a business by accident. And most of them started off very small. And many of the successful business stories that we hear have somehow rather gone through a certain setback before. Likewise, in the area of service, sometimes we may try in this area, tak jadi. We can always try to serve in another area. In a recent mission conference, track mission uh, consultation, which I attended a few days ago, it's the same problem throughout all the, mostly throughout the, all the track churches. Difficult to get people to serve. And in this, uh, this year, track is focusing on the orang aslis and the orang asal. Yeah? Sengois, Semais, Jakun, all the tribes, the orang ulu, the orang sungai, and the Ibans, Kadazans, Tusun, Muruts, Bidayu. It is track's focus that we should do missions work among these indigenous people because more than 40% of the total Christian population in Malaysia are actually Bumi Putras from Sabah, Sarawak, including our orang Aslis. But we just don't bother, we don't care less. Why? As long as I can send my son to a good school in Yogbin or in uh, Petek or SFI, of course, ACS is not on the list. Huh? You know, good schools, St. David, then okay. Others, I don't care. But friends, as a church, we need also to be sensitive for our future generation. You know what I mean? If you look at our population growth, yeah, if you don't continue to serve and encourage people, one day we will be an extinct group of people in the country. So even as the church organizes mission trips to Orang Asli villages, as a pastor, can I appeal to all of you to avail yourselves to go? Don't say that I don't know how to sing Malay song. Lah. I don't know how to play guitar. Lah. You know? Just come and see how you do avail yourselves and see how God can make use of you. Yeah. Don't worry. You may not be gifted, but sometimes God can bring you into the midst of serving for two things. First is to discover ourselves and exercise faith. Henry T. Blackaby reminds us in the book Experiencing God that God's invitation uh, for you to work with Him sometimes or always leads us to a crisis of belief. 
which requires faith in action, something that we can use, an experience that we can use, you know, to challenge our faith. Talking about Boys Brigade, talking about the Nepali migrant work that I'm involved in, you know, I always like to give real life examples. I think it's more meaningful. You know, the late Uncle Chua Cheng Chai, many times he told me, he said, Danny, prior to early 90s, I was helping the school scouts to serve. You know, helping the school uh, scouts to conduct tests or that. Every time when he sees me Saturday afternoon, he said, Danny, come lah, serve the boys' brigade. And actually, I was never a boys' brigade ever. And I cannot even blow one tune with a trumpet. I have to be honest. And you ask me to do drill, I cannot do drill because I was never trained in this area. But yet, God spoke to me and I availed myself. I wasn't gifted in that area. I do not know what BB was all about. But scouting, yes. You know, Nepali work. I cannot speak Nepali at all. I can't speak a single word in 2004 to 2005. Don't say Nepali, being a Pranakan. I can't even speak Mandarin or Hokkien properly with the correct tune. When I go to market, if I speak Mandarin, straight away they speak English with me. You know what I mean. Yeah? The four intonation is always wrong. Yeah. Sometimes God brings us into a ministry that you least expect, that you do not know that you are going into, so that we can discover ourselves and that we can exercise our faith. You know, when we look at our Myanmar ministry, we always feel happy. We feel proud. Yeah, I've got 50, 60 people. But when we reverse back seven years ago, the first time when Sister Nancy, together with Sister Dina, when they brought in Myanmar workers from the factories, and through Sister Dina's contact, her sister-in-law, I think, runs a canteen from in Batu Berendam, when they bring the Myanmar boys and um, girls, they do not speak Myanmar language at all. But yet, as the Spirit led, they did what they were supposed to do. Yeah? Sometimes it can lead us to a crisis of faith. I'm thinking, God, you are very funny. Huh? I cannot speak Myanmar, then you ask me to do Myanmar work. Apa macam ni? You know? God, I cannot speak Nepali, but yet you brought me into the Nepali ministry. I want to share with you how the Nepali Sangati started. We have a Nepali missionary who spent about five to six years in Nepal by the name of Brother Jiang. And because of the government clamp down on missionaries to do missions work in Nepal, he was asked to leave Nepal and go back to Singapore. But his burning desire to evangelize for the whole of Nepal did not end there. So he says, why not, if, since I'm in Singapore, Singapore, not many Nepalese except for the Gurkhas, and the Gurkhas, the Singapore police, they are not allowed to mix with normal citizens, normal Singaporeans. So he said, why not I just go across the causeway? So what he would do is that he would drive to Johor Bahru, go to Moa, Batu Bahru, looking for Nepal, just with one single purpose. And he told me, he said, Danny, sometimes I feel like, God, is it you calling me to do to this work? Ah? No, he also doubted. And I cannot imagine that he actually survived. Every week, he would just drive in. Finally, Batu Bahru, Moa, and at the end of the day, he reached Malaika. And he only started with two or three people. He went to Pasamalam to look for Nepalese and just started, he can speak, write, and read Nepali. So he started talking to the Nepali boys. Yeah, that was way back in 2002. And he also had his faith challenge because he doesn't know anyone in Malaika. And he did not stay in hotel because he had just come back from Nepal in Singapore, and he has not got a proper job yet, okay? So where do you think he slept? Not in Holiday Inn, because Holiday Inn belum naik lagi. 
not in Equatorial. He drove his car to the car park in Makota Hotel. At the basement, the first floor of car park, he slept there overnight. I can cry when I tell you this story. Can we begin serving like this? Once, I followed him to Bukit Rambai to visit one of the boys, Kul Tamang. He slept in the hostel and it was a furniture, wood, wood factory in Bukit Rambai. Where did we sleep? We only sleep on a piece of plywood on the floor. And a, <coughs> a normal furniture factory is always filled with sawdust. You know, we are actually sleeping in a factory. Just open space. Plywood, five or six of us, with a fan blowing. And guess what? What is blowing? The sawdust. So the next morning, our face is just like, you know, our ladies who use makeup, huh? you know, like our powder, huh? you create one side, huh? yeah. Wow. Literally like that. I'm not exaggerating. But friends, if you really want to serve, be prepared to serve to this extent. When we look at John chapter 4, my favorite verse, when Jesus went into the Samaritan village, the villagers came out to meet him, I think verse 40, 41, and the villagers invited Jesus to go into the village. And it says, and Jesus stayed there for two more days. The next verse tells us, and many more came to know God. Friends, are we expected or are we ready to serve to that extent? I'm not asking you all to stay with the Orang Asli yet. Yeah? Our Orang Asli trip is only one day trip. If I said, maybe if we organize, stay there two, three days, first thing you all will ask me, Pastor, Orang Asli village, ada toilet ke tak ada? I will tell you ada. All automatic. You tekan, psh, all will come up. Don't worry, God will provide a toilet for you. In Orang Asli village, you can find toilets everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. So don't worry about toilet. Water supply, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Just come and join us. Yeah, your faith may be challenged. God, why are you leading me into this type of ministry? Don't worry. There are a lot of many, many success stories. The second thing that, you know, when God leads us to service, first one is to discover ourselves and exercise our faith. The second thing that God may want to do to us is that to teach us and mold us. You know, I've asked a few people whether they can serve in BB or GB. Some of them, a few of them rather, said that they're not gifted young people, you know, not so patient with young people. Maybe as we serve helping the GB girls and the BB boys, for example, I am not a patient person. I cannot tahan young people running around, you know. The nickname that I think I will use for these young people is the destroyer. You know why? Wherever they go, they langgar barang. They play games, the garden lights will break. When they go to the toilet, the taps will not be on. All the toilet pipes will rose up. You know, all the glass doors will break because they play football. They are the destroyers. Maybe if we give our chance, a chance to ourselves to serve. Yeah. It may be a process of building up our own character. How we can be patient with these boys. Or maybe God is telling us that as I serve the boys' brigade and the girls' brigade, you know, I can learn, I can rediscover myself. What is God teaching me? Probably God wants to tell me that, hey, look, these are all God's cre creation. They are God's children. Maybe God wants me to learn to see the way God sees these boys and girls who need somebody to mentor them. 
who needs somebody to teach them. Friends, we can always treat our service if we are not <coughs> well trained in a particular area as a process, as a means of God to teach us and to mold us. The challenge is this. Are we prepared to avail ourselves? Friends, if you and I want to be great, change our mindset. Ask God to change us from our heart because we know that He is the potter and we are the clay. Matthew 23, 11 reminds us, the greatest among you will be your servant. Mark 10, 45 reminds us again, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So as we live this sanctuary today, as we look at this cute, innocent, innocent, uh, still innocent, I think, uh, cute looking, innocent boys and girls, can we not ask God to speak to us or open our hearts, whether it's Boys Brigade, whether it's Girls Brigade, whether it's Myanmar Ministry to be a driver, whether it's Nepali Ministry to be a driver, whether it's an usher, whether to go into the Orang Asli villages to help with the missions committee, whether to be a, on permanent roster to wash the plates and cup for the next one month, for example. Yeah, I, Thomas Wee, volunteer to wash the cups and plates of Malacca Wesley for the next one month. Wow, praise the Lord. I, Major Wee Tiong Ken, since I'm trained in the army, will volunteer to wash the toilet until shining, shining, like how I polish my boots for the next three months. And my helper will be Carol Wee. How nice. Yeah, friends, as we live today, think, pray, and ask God of an area of service which we can do for the church within this community as well as something which we can do for our community outside. Then truly, God will know that we are talking about the love of Christ. As we look at Jesus, how he served others, I think, when I say this, it's a reminder to myself, we are all made in the image of God. Let us serve one another. Let us serve others. And for us, who have been self-centered all these years, I pray that even as the Lord speaks to us this morning, that we might change our attitude. Friends, many of us have got not many years to live. You know, I always tell people, kita semua sudah tua. In my own Pranakan language, may sound a bit rude. Right? Sudah tua, entah bila mau mati. Right? Change for the better. Entah bila mau goal. Don't know when we are going to kick the bucket. Serve one another instead of sitting down and waiting to be served. With the attitude that I am boss. I am from the royalty. I am His Majesty or Her Majesty. Friends, look at God, look at Christ, how he served by giving himself for each and every one of us. As we come to a close, as we sing the closing song, can I invite the worship team to come? Let us ask ourselves if God has been speaking to us for the last few weeks, last few months, or even this morning, can we avail ourselves in one area of ministry or two areas of ministry that indeed God can use us, God can mold us into the person that He wants us to be?